Janet, for leading us in prayer. Well, when I think about my life, there are few moments more profound than when I first met each of my three sons. I remember with Jack, um, the nurse kind of surprised Katie and I um, by sort of like immediately, the moment Jack was born, just like dumping him onto her chest. And we both kind of like jumped, what? <laughs> out, of, out of nowhere, here was this wet, goopy, blue-skinned creature showing up like, okay, now keep me alive. <laughs> Watching this helpless, vulnerable person emerge into the world is just transformational. Holding him in my arms, looking into his eyes that are just learning to open. All three times, with Luke and Sam and Jack, it was just an amazing experience. Kurt Thompson, a Christian psychiatrist and author, writes this. We are all born into the world looking for someone looking for us. And we remain in this mode of searching for the rest of our lives. Let me read that again. We are all born into the world looking for someone looking for us. And we remain in this mode of searching for the rest of of our lives. We are all born with this bone deep desire to be known fully and to be loved fully. To see ourselves being seen and being loved in the eyes of another. Now, as we go through life, um, sadly, this desire gets beaten down. It gets ignored, it gets crushed. We learn to hide and pretend to protect ourselves, to survive. Life teaches us that love can't really be unconditional. Life can't really be all about love, not in a world ruled by money, sex, and power. And yet that desire still remains in our hearts to know and be known, and to be loved. So is this inborn desire just a, a cruel joke? Just an impossible desire that will never find satisfaction or fulfillment? Or can we actually know that we are fully known and fully loved? And can that love actually become the center of gravity around which everything else orbits? Can life, the universe, and everything really be all about love? Well, let's turn to the Christian scriptures this morning. Today we're going to be reading from the book of 1 John, chapter 4. And just a reminder that as we read the Bible, that we believe that we are doing more than just studying an ancient text. We believe that God is actually, actively speaking to us through these words. And so would you join me in asking the Holy Spirit to help us hear God's word this morning. Pray with me. Come Holy Spirit, we need you. We need your light. Help us to see and hear. In, your name, in, in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to start in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love Because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. This is the word of the Lord, and we're grateful. Amen. Today we begin a new series entitled Paradigm, Seeing the World Like Jesus. And over the next eight weeks, uh, we're going to be discussing eight axioms that that, uh, Katie's and my friends, Matt and Matt Tebby and Ben Sturkey, um, share in their book, Having the Mind of Christ. They use these axioms in their church and in their discipleship coaching. These axioms are intended to help us reframe the way we see God and the world and open us up to receive the transformation that Jesus wants to bring in our lives. We can sort of think of these axioms um, like corrective lenses. So, So I wear contacts and glasses. I have really terrible eyesight. I have severe astigmatism and uh, nearsightedness, and if I weren't wearing my contacts right now, I couldn't read the words on the page in front of me, I definitely couldn't see all of you, like every, everything would be just a huge blur. My lenses help me to see the world clearly. Unfortunately though, my prescription, let's just say it's a little outdated. <laughs> I haven't been to the eye doctor in a little while, and I really need to get a new prescription. Um, I've been busy with a couple things, but... Think of this series as an eye exam for your paradigms. All of us see the world through a particular set of lenses. We have a particular set of assumptions that, that we have about the world and about God that we've received for, through maybe our families of origin or through um, our life experiences, good or bad, through um, growing up in a Western culture or whatever one's culture of origin might be. Our educations and especially our past religious experiences, if, if we've had these. If we don't take the time to examine these paradigms, they remain invisible, under the surface, influencing not just the way that we see the world and relate to God, but also affecting the way that we act in the world. So, an important question in this series is, are we seeing clearly? Are we seeing the world like Jesus? So let's look back at our scripture reading this morning. In just 14 verses, the word love appears 27 times. Any guess what topic the author is trying to talk about? (laughs) Obviously, superlapsarian predestination, right? (laughs) No, of course not. He's talking about love. He starts about talking about love within the Christian community. He says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is 
love. So this is the first part of the first axiom. Quite simply, God is love. God is love. This is a remarkable statement. Notice that John doesn't say that God has love or that God loves us or loves the world or even that God is loving. John says that God is love. That this quality, love, finds its ultimate origin in God. Now this is where it gets a little mind-blowing. John is saying that when we act in love, we are actually participating in God's nature in some mysterious way. He says, love comes from God. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Sort of makes me think of kitchen appliances. (laughs) You know, a kitchen appliance doesn't generate electricity. It doesn't have its own power source. It has to be plugged into the wall outlet. But once it's plugged into the wall outlet, it can participate in the electrical circuit. God's love is like electricity. Love's origin isn't in us. But when we love others... We actually become conduits of God's love. We actually participate in God's love the way the appliance participates in the electrical circuit. We participate in God's love. God is love. That means that love is essential to God's character, or to say it another way. Love is not one option on God's color palette. Love is the base paint from which all the other colors are mixed. Let me say that again. Love isn't just one option on God's color palette. Love is the base paint from which all the other colors are mixed. Now, I can almost hear some of you saying, yes, but what about justice? What about holiness? What about truth? For some reason, when we say that God is love, we feel the need to put like an asterisk or a footnote there, as though God's love needs to be balanced out by some sort of opposing force. So God is love, but God is also just. And that's true, but I think sometimes when we say that, what we mean underneath that is that, well, God is nice, but God can also be mean. But love isn't niceness. That's a really shallow, insipid definition of love. And when we talk this way, we reveal that we're thinking of love as something basically soft and useless. Nice to have around, but not actually able to get the real work done. Right? We need a little bit of meanness, right, to get things done. Well... The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a very different way of thinking about love. He said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. Wow. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That's why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil, triumphant. That's why Dr. King believed that Christian love was the most powerful force for social change in the world. Maybe we need to allow our definitions and categories to be defined and refined in the fire of God's love recognizing that God's justice is actually an expression of God's love. You know, the times when my kids make me the angriest is when they hurt each other. In those moments, it's not that I've stopped loving them. 
In fact, it's my love that fuels my anger because I don't want to see my little boy get hurt, right? My anger in that moment is an expression of my love. In the same way, God's justice or wrath is just the flip side of the coin of his love. It is motivated by love. So God is love. Now, let's talk about the second part of the axiom. It's all about love. It's all about love. What is it? Well, the Christian life, discipleship, life in general, the purpose of life, the whole cosmos, everything. It's all about love. It's one thing to say that God is love, but it's another thing to say that it all, everything, is about love. And because so much of our regular daily existence seems to contradict this, right? Um, Are your employee reviews all about love? Are your grades in school all about love? Is your retirement plan all about love? Is brushing your teeth all about love? Is filing your taxes all about love? Is driving on I-25 all about love? (laughs) Looking at the obvious evidence, it might be tempting to say that life is all about survival, about getting mine first and keeping others from taking it away, that life is about power, that life is about shaping the world in some small way to, to fit with my will and my desire. But the Christian scriptures make a startling claim that life, start to finish, is all about love. John, in our passage today, says, Dear friends, let us love one another. And goes on to say, Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. That's pretty severe talk. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he, God, has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. He's talking about love within the Christian community. Love like within a family. That's why he talks and uses the language of brother and sister. According to John, love is a quality that should define anyone who knows and loves God. And he says that if we don't love our brothers and sisters, well, then it's just not true. And he says this love that's meant to define the Christian life, when we look at the whole of Scripture, we see that this love that's meant to define the whole of Christian life extends beyond just the circle of the church community. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus teaches us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. If you sort of picture like a frame hanging on a nail, all the law and the prophets hang on those two commands, loving God and loving our neighbors. And earlier in the same gospel, Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Love each other, love your neighbor, love your enemy. Now take a moment and think about the people in your ordinary everyday life, the people that you interact with on any sort of regular basis, the people that you like, just happen to like, bump into in the grocery store. Does this list leave any of them out? Loving each other, loving your neighbor, loving your enemy. Friends, it's all about love. And the message of Scripture is clear. If we don't have love, we don't have anything. So let's put it all together. 
God is love. So it's all about love. Dante Alighieri, in the closing line of his epic Divine Comedy, refers to God as the love which moves the sun and the other stars. That's beautiful. The love which moves the sun and the other stars. If God, who is love, made the universe and all of us in love for love, then it stands to reason to say that all of it, everything, is about love. Now, you might be listening to this and thinking, well, Chuck, this message is just a string of one cliche after another. You keep talking about love, but what does love mean anyway? Great question, hypothetical person. <laughs> what is love? Popular culture tends to define love as romance, or a warm feeling, or an abstract value. But in the Christian scriptures, love is never a mere abstraction. If you asked John what love is, he would point to Jesus on the cross and say, here is love. He writes this, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He goes on to say, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So what is love? To answer that, we have to look at Jesus. It's Jesus who has shown us what real love looks like. Jesus gave himself away in love for our good. And he calls us to give ourselves away in love for the good of others. Now, I know for me, my temptation when I hear these words is to really, like, try to muster up my best efforts, to really try to give it my best shot. Like, I'm going to be more like Jesus. I'm going to love people just like Jesus does. Well, trying harder, learning more tips and tricks, um, using sheer willpower, none of that works. That way of thinking is actually backwards. Because, as John points out, we love because he first loved us. Earlier, I said that when we love others, we are actually participating in God's love and we become conduits of God's love to the world. So we have to actually receive God's love in order to be able to share God's love with others. So friends, that's why the goal is divine union. The goal is divine union. Okay, this is a heady idea, so stick with me for a moment. God is love, and it's all about love, and so the goal is divine union. The goal of discipleship, the goal of life in general, is to be united with Christ. Matt and Ben call this communion in love in their book. It's what we're talking about, when we say our mission is to invite people to enjoy life with God. Divine union, participation, communion and love, life with God, all different ways of saying the same thing. So what would you say is the goal of your discipleship, your Bible study, your mission trip, your spiritual practices? What would you say is the goal of your life on Tuesday? What's the goal of your week? The corrective lens that is being offered to us is to say this, that the goal of it all is divine union. Growing in love is not about our effort or education. It's about living in God's love, abiding in God's love. John puts it this way. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. 
And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. We are invited into the life of God. If anyone, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. That's what it means to participate in the very life and love of God. The love that moves the sun and the other stars. The love revealed in Jesus Christ. And that's why, that's why it's all about love. God is love, so it's all about love. Now, why does all this matter? I've discovered that often we Christians have a tendency to treat others the way that we believe that God treats us. We relate to others the way that we believe that God relates to us. We might say, God is love, or God loves me. But deep down in our bones, we still believe that we have to work tirelessly to stay on God's good side, to, to earn God's love. But what if, in fact, God is love, and it's all about love? Back to the analogy of the eye exam. In the weeks ahead, I'd or in the week ahead, I'd encourage you to, to take this axiom and kind of try it on for size. See how it fits. Does it change the way you see things? Does it make some things clearer for you? Try it out. In their book, Matt and Ben have what they call an experiment of trust at the end of each chapter. And today, kind of in closing, I just want to invite us to do a shortened form of this experiment. So I just want to invite you to close your eyes and just take a moment to get comfortable in your seat. And take a few deep breaths. Come, Holy Spirit. I invite you to fill the space this time. Fill us all. Take a moment now, and I want you to picture yourself at the center of God's love. The God's love surrounds you, is above you and below you on both sides. You are wrapped up in God's love. Now picture God's love inside of you, filling you up. You are filled with God's love. You are abiding in God's love. Take a few more deep breaths. Now 
I want you to picture the people in your life, your friends, your family, the people in this room, all of us. Picture all of us together inside of God's love. God's love surrounding us. God's love filling us. Just take a moment to sit with that picture. Just take one more moment and talk to God about whatever's on your heart and take a moment to listen to what God wants to share with you. Almighty and loving God, Jesus Christ, His only Son, and Holy Spirit, triune God, we thank you and praise you for your great love that you have invited us into. Help us to love you, to love each other, and to love this world the way that you love us. Help us to participate in your great love. We thank you and praise you, for you are worthy. Amen.